is on cells. And there are lots of different types of cells because again, remember the five principles of all living things, um, uh, living things is one of them is growth and differentiation, right? So you have growth and uh, differentiation. And that differentiation basically is you have certain stem cells you're born with and those stem cells have the ability to change, which is differentiation. Differentiation means change. And they're gonna differentiate into different, completely different types of cells that have different structures, different functions, and um, enable us to have all these different organ systems going on, right? And so cells look very different. They can have different um, jobs. So a fat cell or adipocyte, they store fat, right? And so fat's another way of saying energy. So they store energy. They have a nucleus and a cell membrane and a bunch of lipids, right? And that's it. Super different from a muscle cell. So muscle cells have contractile proteins um, that help the muscle shorten. And there's mitochondria and there are endoplasmic reticulums and all these different things inside the cell um, structures. And all of these structures uh, use energy, right? So these type of cells use energy because there is a lot of infrastructure. These type of cells don't use energy, they store energy. Um, so why am I bringing this up? Because, you know, a lot of times people hear, oh, muscles use more energy than fat. Yeah, because muscles require infrastructure, these contractile proteins in order for them to slide past one another have to use energy to make that happen. And fat cells just store energy. Um, they don't use any energy to exist. So, um, well, they use teeny, 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 tiny amounts of energy. They're energy stores. So understanding the structure of a cell, understanding how the cell is built, what's inside it, and what its purpose is or function is, helps you also understand how and why um, our physiology is the way it is, right? Um, so we're going to go through the cell and talk about um, these different properties that make cells different from one another and why it's important. Um, what I do want to mention to you guys is that um, it is good that you go over the Latin and Greek root uh, study appendix in the back of your book because Anatomy is very repetitive in the fact that these suffixes, or I should say prefixes and suffixes, the things before word and after word that are added on, uh, are repetitive. They always will mean the same thing. So A will always mean with, without. So when I say avascular, vascular refers to blood flow. When you say something is vascular, you are saying it has blood flowing to it. When you put A before vascular, it now means without blood flow. Ab would be from or away. So abnormal is away from normal. Uh, so a lot of things that you see over and over again, um, ecto and endo. Um, ecto always means outside, endo always means outside. X always means outside or away from. So if I were to say endocrine glands, right? Endo means inside. So endocrine glands secrete things um, into the body and it stays in the body right? Because endo means inside. Exo, so exocrine glands are going to secrete 
things that leave body, right? Or exit. You'll see this with endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is going to basically bring it into the cell. Exocytosis would make it go out. So it's cytosis is re site refers to cell. And if it's endocytosis, it's going into the cell. If it's exocytosis, it's leaving the cell. Epi is always going to mean on top or around the outside. You'll see epimesium, epineurium, uh, epicardium. Epi always means outside. So mesium would be muscle on the outside of a muscle. Epicardium would be on the outside of the cardiac muscle. Um, hyper, hypo, above or below. Um, these are just super common terms. Peri, uh, meaning around. So uh, good to kind of go through those so you don't have to constantly be relearning certain words, right? You just, you know the prefixes and suffixes and then you start to then be able to kind of guesstimate what a word is. All right, so cells. Um, cells are the structural building blocks of all plants and animals. They are the smallest functional unit. So cells are the smallest structural functional unit that performs all vital functions. Most cells, we have to use a microscope to see them. And we use light microscopes. We're not going to be using the light microscopes in lab um, this semester, but, uh, let you use a light microscope to see them. And so this is showing you, uh, this is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And we're going to go over this in chapter three. This is a tissue. This is epithelial tissue, epi. Remember, epi means outside, right? So if you go back and you look at this, epi means on, over, or on top of. So when we talk about epithelium, it's going to be on top or outside. It's a lining tissue. So we're going to talk about that in chapter three. This down below is connective tissue. And we'll talk about that below as well uh, in chapter three. But what I'm trying to show you is these are cells and we look at them on a light microscope and this is what it would look like if we looked at it in a microscope in our lab. If we had a really special cool scanning electron microscope that uses um, electrons beaming through it, we would have this really great high definition, but we don't have that in our lab. All right, back to cells. Okay, so a generalized animal cell. I told you, I showed you all those different pictures of the differentiation, how different cells can look. We're just gonna talk about a generalized animal cell called a somatic cell. And um, all of these cells are gonna have a couple of things that are gonna be identical, whether it's an adipocyte or a smooth muscle cell. All of them are going to have a cell membrane and stuff inside the cell. So the cell membrane is the membrane that surrounds the cells and important to understand, it's also called a plasma lemma or it can go by a different name. If it's a muscle, skeletal muscle cell, it's called a sarcolemma or a neurolemma on a neuron, you'll see that. It's, they're all plasma membranes or, or cell membranes. Uh, and the cell membrane's job is to separate the cell's internal parts from the external environment, and that could be fluid, it could be you know, bone tissue, it could be a number of things, but the cell membrane separates what's inside the cell from what's outside the cell. And again, remember I talked about extra meaning outside, so extracellular fluid means outside the cell. Intracellular fluid, the word intra means inside, so this is inside the cell. So intracellular fluid, is also called cytosol. So this is intracellular fluid, right? So that's the fluid inside the cell. The other stuff inside the cell, right, as defined by the cell membrane, the cell membrane defines uh, the parameters of that cell. 
Um, so everything inside the cell membrane is cytoplasm. Cytoplasm gets further broken down into the intracellular fluid or cytosol. And then the other bigger things and um, side of the cell that are structural in nature. And those are the organelles. Um, there are non-membranous organelles, meaning they do not have membranes around them. They are proteins, um, like cytoskeleton proteins. They could be structures on the um, surface of the cell membrane, like cilia, um, and microvilli. They can be things for mitosis, like centrioles, or they could be little structures, like ribosomes, that help um, build proteins inside your cell. Uh, some of the organelles have membranes around them, the mitochondria, where you can create uh, ATP, which is what the um, cells use as an energy source. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum helps build proteins and package them. Golgi apparatus will help package them to exit the cell. And then lysosomes and peroxisomes help um, protect the cell um, from pathogens or free radicals or things that you uh, could damage the structures inside the cell. Now, for this class, uh, I am going over organelles briefly but that's all we're gonna do, it's brief. We're not gonna study the organelles and we're, I'm not gonna quiz you on the organelles or ask you questions on it. What I am interested in you guys mastering and learning and understanding is the cell membrane and um, the cell and the cell membrane and generally cytoplasm and how it gets broken down. It's really important to understand the cell membrane if the cell membrane breaks down, then everything inside the cell leaves the cell and the cell no longer becomes a functional unit. So if cell membrane breaks, cell can no longer function because it now has lost everything that's inside the cell to the extracellular environment and can't do its job, right? And so the cell will die. So if the cell membrane breaks, cell dies. If cell dies, guess what? The tissue eventually dies. And then the organ dies, right? And then organ. So it's really, the cells are super important. If you have a cell membrane break and everything inside the cell leaves, that's um, going to start to uh, result in tissue death. And so that's why if someone's having a heart attack or has rhabdomyolysis or something, you're going to check enzymes in the blood because certain high quantities of enzymes that should be inside a muscle cell, whether it's a cardiac muscle cell or a skeletal muscle cell, if that cell membrane breaks, those enzymes are now entering into the extracellular fluid, which is called interstitial fluid, and then it's going to be absorbed into your bloodstream. And so you end up having high quantities of these enzymes that are normally inside a cell, and they are now flooding the outside extracellular environment. And so uh, you could see that in a blood test. You can see cell death, muscle death on a, um, and a blood test. Uh, so cells are really important. The integrity of that membrane is really important. Um, and so the plasma lemma is really what we're focusing on because cell membranes really keep the cells functioning and productive and, and able to perform their jobs. So cell membrane has a couple functions. One is physical isolation. It separates Right, so it separates uh, the internal or intracellular environment from the extracellular environment. And this is important because in order for cells to regulate and function and produce ATP and do specific jobs, it needs to control its environment. And so the cell membrane isolates it from the external environment so it can continue to kind of regulate and do its job. So uh, number two is regulation of exchange with the environment, permeability. 
the definition of permeability is the ability to go through something. So if a gate can open, it is said to be permeable. You can go through that gate. If the gate does not open, it's impermeable and you cannot go through it. Um, well, cell membranes are said to be selectively permeable. So cell membranes are selectively permeable. Meaning some things can go through it. And who decides what goes through? The structures on the cell membrane. Um, so the structures in the cell membrane can be ion or protein channels that go all the way through that are regulated based on something binding to that channel in order for it to open up. So these channels are not always open. They open if there's a hormone present or they open if there is some, some stimulation to open them. Uh, the, certain things can go through the cell membrane if there are aquaporins in them. And so these cell membranes are not always permeable to everything. They're selectively permeable, and there's usually a reason why they will be permeable. Um, I'm talking in general terms right now. So three is sensitivity. So there are receptors on the, out, on the membrane that tell the cell when to be permeable or when to react to something, right? So those can be neurotransmitters or hormones or sometimes ions. So certain things uh, can bind to receptors and that's called sensitivity because then it, it's sensitive to these certain things and that will then regulate the permeability of substances. Also cell membranes allow for cells to communicate with one another and also connect to one another, right? So adhesion. So cell membranes, um, plasma membranes, uh, the structure is important to understand because the structure determines its permeability to some things and its impermeability or lack of permeability to other things. And the structure is a phospholipid bilayer. So phospholipid bilayer with the phosphate Phospho heads facing out and the fatty acid lipid tails facing inward. All right, so let's kind of unpack that. So um, lipid, lipids are fats. Fats are non-polar molecules, meaning they don't have polarity. There's no plus and minus sides to them. There's no extra electron or extra proton. Um, so that's important, nonpolar. Um, phosphate heads are polar. Are polar molecules. Meaning they have a charge, right? So there's a plus or a minus or both, but they have polarity to them. Okay, and... <clears throat> If you guys have ever tried to have two pluses go together, like if you have a magnet, there's a plus side of the magnet and a negative side to the magnet. Um, if you try to have two pluses move together, they're gonna repel one another. But if you have a plus on one side and a negative on the other, they're going to be attracted to one another. There's polarity. Polarity things, like polarity things and nonpolar things like nonpolar things. So nonpolar only associates with nonpolar. And polar associates with polar only, right? So they discriminate. And so this structure is a phospholipid bilayer. So you have the phosphate heads facing out and facing in. So this is inside cell and this is outside cell. And the, uh, I'm drawing that this is the phospholipid bilayer, right? And so this is cell membrane. So there's my cell. Um, so the phosphate heads are, in, and these are the lipid tails. 
So this is fat nonpolar lipids here in the middle. And on the outside are these polar, polar heads. And you're still going, okay, big deal. Well, here's, here's the big deal, is that uh, extracellular fluid, which is out here, and inside the cell is intracellular fluid. And what do you think the major component of fluid is? It is water. So the major component of both extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid is water. And water is a polar molecule where the hydrogens have given up their electrons to the oxygen. And so you end up with the oxygen having more electrons and a negative charge. And the hydrogens are called protons because they've given up their electron and they only have a proton. And they're polar. And water being polar, water molecules like to stick together right? Because they're all polar. So what happens is water, you'll have the hydrogens of one water molecule kind of want to stay next to the other water molecule. And so this happens, and I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you spill water, it tends to stay in a little ball um, if it's on like a, a surface like a metal table because that water is not going to interact with the metal and the water molecules are all going to stick together because they're polar. Now, nonpolar does not associate with polar. And so what happens is, is that fat molecules that are nonpolar um, tend to stick together too, right? So these nonpolar stick together and they don't like to associate with uh, polar molecules. And this is seen in when you try to mix oil and water. Right? You're making salad dressing and you have um, some kind of olive oil or some oil and then you have some water-based part of it that has seasoning and you have to shake the dressing to try to force the nonpolar fat oil to mix with the waterous part of that salad dressing. And then if you let it sit for a while, again, the nonpolar fat will kind of come together and stick to itself and the water portion or polar portion are going to migrate to another end of your container and stick together as well. And so this enables the cell membrane to be selectively permeable because things that are inside the cell are going to be in a polar environment or they're polar like um, getting potassium or sodium. These are polar ions. They can't go through a fat lipid layer because polar cannot go through nonpolar. So polar cannot go through nonpolar. And so this lipid bilayer, this, this fat lipid bilayer here is keeping anything that's polar out right? Or in, I should say. So uh, you're going to have this fat lipid inner bilayer making sure that nothing from inside <clears throat> gets to the outside and nothing from outside, because this is also polar, can't go through, right? It's going to bounce back because it can't go through this lipid bilayer. Now, if you have these channel proteins here, this is an ion, <clears throat> and channel protein here, these protein channels can open and close and allow polar molecules to go into the cell. But this is regulated, that's selectively regulated. So these phospholipid heads being polar, they associate with the aqueous polar environment here and here, and they're okay with polar. The phosphate heads are okay with polar, and so they can coexist in this, this aqueous environment, but this lipid bilayer in the middle makes sure that just not everything goes through it. So that's an important thing that we go over this phospholipid bilayer, why you learn it. I think they brush over it in uh, biology, but it's important to understand because it really does keep it selectively permeable. So the phospholipid bilayer 
keeps the membrane, cell membrane, selectively permeable. Um, so hydrophobic heads, and this is wrong, so I want you to correct this. So they are hydrophilic heads. They love water. So hydro is water or polar. And the fatty acid ta tails are phobic. I don't know why I've never fixed that slide, but I just never have. Um, so on the outer layer, you have glycolipids. Glyco refers to sugars. Oops, I'm not able to. Let's try that again. Glyco is sugars, lipids are fats, um, or glycoproteins, right? And so these are structures for communication and um, for cells to adhere to one another. So <clears throat> two types of proteins are um, attached or embedded in the cell membrane. Uh, they could be peripheral proteins, and they're just attached to one side or the other. They're on the periphery. So Peripheral proteins can be these proteins that are just on one side or another. You can have a peripheral protein here as well. Uh, integral proteins integrate all the way through the cell membrane. So these would be like the ion channels or um, protein channels for things to come through. These channels are um, generally gated or have some mechanism to open and close. Uh, to allow for that selective permeability. Cholesterol, 95% of your cholesterol is created by your liver and um, is used actually for structure and, um, and a lot of it is in your cell membranes. Um, cholesterol makes the membranes more flexible and fluid. And uh, so another point that I wanna make about these integral proteins before we leave is that um, integral proteins are sometimes embedded in the membrane and sometimes they're not. And so these things can move. And so since they can move, you need cholesterol to kind of keep this um, membrane fluid. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, of when things, let me see if I have another slide here. I'll just do it here. So uh, an example of this is, and let me erase all this. So let's talk about type two diabetes because type two diabetes is um, something that is becoming more common than not, which is, which is too bad, but it is. So what is type two diabetes? Well, um, Cell membranes are not always permeable, permeable to glucose or sugar, okay? So glucose is sugar or simple carbohydrates or monosaccharides, okay? So uh, if you have, if you eat or consume a bunch of sugar, or even carbohydrates. They get it does have all carbohydrates have to get broken down into the monosaccharide glucose or fructose or maltose, but mostly glucose. And so then it gets absorbed from your small intestines into your blood. And your blood circulates, and this glucose is meant to go into the cells. And so you can do glycolysis or oxidative phosphorylation and take the energy out of glucose. And oops, did not mean to do that. And put it into a molecule called ATP. And ATP is what cells use for energy. And so this has to happen inside the cell. So the cell needs glucose to essentially um, take the energy out of the glucose molecular bonds and then transfer that energy into the bonds of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And so cells continuously need energy and they need that glucose to come in, into the cell. So what the hormone um, insulin, so it's a hormone created by the pancreas. Um, and so this hormone insulin binds to a receptor on the cell membrane of all cells, all cells that that need 
to create energy. And so it binds to a receptor here, right? And so glucose, uh, let me back up. Once you have blood glucose, um, so your blood glucose goes up. The pancreas then secretes insulin in response. Insulin then binds to receptors on the cell membrane. Um, binding of insulin to a receptor on the cell membrane is going to cause these what are called GLUT4 channels to then embed themselves into the cell membrane. And once these GLUT4 channels embed themselves into the membrane, you can have glucose enter cell. Right, so glucose can come from out here and now enter cell because you have these GLUT4 channels. If you don't have insulin, you don't have GLUT4 channels uh, readily embedded into the cell membrane. And so insulin is the hormone that then regulates the permeability of glucose into a cell. Once glucose gets into the cell, now you can start producing energy, right? Uh, so with type 2 diabetes, this is an issue with uh, the insulin glucose receptor. So this right here is breaking down. And so the pancreas still produces insulin. Type 1 diabetes is where the pancreas produces no insulin. Type 2 diabetes is where the pancreas is still producing insulin, but there's a breakdown in the insulin receptor mechanism. And so as a result, um, what we find is this mechanism breaks down and these channels never get uh, inserted into the cell membrane. And so glucose never gets into the cell at a rate. And so what happens is there's a hard time then producing ATP. Also, if glucose is not getting into the cell, right, it stays in the blood, and this results in high blood sugar, right? So um, I'm going through this scenario so you understand how important it is to uh, really maintain the integrity of the cell membrane staying selectively permeable and to have it done correctly. Because if you end up with high blood sugar, then you start killing off your kidneys because your kidneys are what filter blood, right? So the kidneys start suffering. You also start having neurological problems because you have too much sugar in your blood and it clogs up the capillaries and causes issues. You also have the problem with the cells who are not getting ATP created adequately. And so your liver has to start kind of creating a pseudo glucose called uh, keto acids, and that causes other problems. So just this alone starts causing a domino effect on other organs because the cell membrane is no longer functioning in a selectively permeable way. So understanding cell membranes is so important to understanding underlying diseases because a lot of diseases are the result of cells not either doing their job or not being able to do their job. And so that causes cell problems and that eventually causes organ problems or what we would call disease. Um, so understanding the cell membrane important, understanding the mechanisms by which things get into and out of the cell are also important. And so that's really the last part of this chapter that you need to focus on. So we're gonna go through permeability, right? So we discussed this already. This is the definition, these are definitions. And it's important to understand the definition between impermeable, meaning nothing crosses the barrier, freely permeable, which means everything gets in. So that's not much of a barrier, right? Selectively permeable, this, this is cell membranes because not everything gets through all the time. Some things get through, some things don't. Some things are really highly regulated. Other things are not regulated at all, like gases. Um, gases are freely permeable. So gases are O2 and carbon dioxide. Um, nitrogen, but you know, we don't usually 
um, nitrogen doesn't usually uh, kind of deal with our or dissolve into our blood unless you're a hundred meters underwater or I should say 10 meters underwater nitrogen will start dissolving in our blood but other than that it doesn't really you know air is mostly oxygen carbon um, dioxide and nitrogen so uh, nitrogen is what we call inert it doesn't make sense so the gases that are freely prone oxygen carbon dioxide can cross the cell membrane at any point in time they're freely permeable most other things are selectively permeable the pro processes by which things can get into and out of a cell are passive or active and passive means no energy is required Active means you need to use energy to get things into or out. So, so there are three passive processes. There's just basic diffusion, facilitated diffusion, that is things diffusing with the use of a channel um, or some kind of integral protein. Uh, or osmosis, and that has to do with water. Okay, so we'll talk about those three passive processes that require no energy. The active ones are active transport. This is active transport is you can move a substance regardless of um, concentration gradient. And uh, endo and exocytosis is uh, moving things across cell membrane with the use of vesicles. Uh, all of these require energy, right? They are all active. Anything that's active requires energy. So let's go through these things. All right, so passive first, right? Now, things going through the cell membrane are going to depend a lot on the size of the molecule, whether the molecule has a charge, does it have a plus or a minus, right? Because that affects polarity. Uh, the structure of it, um, the structure is gonna determine what kind of channel protein, because they're specific to specific structures, uh, whether it's soluble in uh, water or fluid, or a combination of factors. So some things are just too big. There are not channel proteins big enough. So plasma proteins, they stay in the blood. They're just too big to go through a capillary wall uh, unless the capillary breaks. So when you have a bruise, um, that are those are capillaries that have broken open and everything inside the capillary floods out into the interstitial environment, including plasma proteins. And that's why you have what we call swelling. You have additional fluid out there because you now have these big proteins that stay out there. And it takes time to repair the capillary wall and then get those plasma proteins out so the fluid can get reabsorbed back into your, your circulatory system. Um, so some things are just too big. They're not supposed to be moving across the cell membrane. Uh, and then other things like electrical charges, you have specific ion channels for specific ions with specific charges. You have um, structural, like GLUT4 are specifically for the structure of glucose, right? So they're specific. Um, the different types of passive processes is diffusion, um, osmosis again, and facilitated diffusion. So let's go through those three. Um, diffusion is basically things are going to naturally go from a high concentration and by the way these brackets here are the universal symbol representing concentration of so say we're talking about sodium if i have sodium written in there then I'm talking about the concentration of sodium. If you have sodium on one side and then you have the membrane and you have a low concentration over on this side and then you open up an ion channel that allows sodium to move, it's always gonna move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. It's kind of like people. If you have a bunch of people, and I am no artist, <laughs> 
So say you have a container here. And this container has four people in it, but it's a really small, small container. And then you open a door. Say I open a door right there. And the door is to another container that's right next door that has one person. Do you think all four of these people are going to stay in that tight container smashed up next to one another when they see this door open up so they can go to the container next door? No. These people are going to move into an area where there's more space until there's equal numbers. Here, I'll put five people in here. Okay, so what's going to happen is, naturally speaking, without being told, two of these people are going to move over here. And so what is going to happen is that three people generally stay on one side and three people stay on the other side because now they're equal on both sides and there's no reason to actually go anywhere. Molecules are the same as people. They don't want to be smashed up against one another. So when you have a high concentration, that means it's talking about the concentration of molecules. So you have a high number of molecules over on this side of the membrane and you have a low number of molecules on this side, um, they're going to naturally want to be spaced out the same. And so molecules are naturally going to go from where they're highly concentrated next to each other to an area where there's more space and they can spread out. They don't like to bump up against one another. That doesn't require energy. They don't have to be told to do that. They're just naturally going to do that. And they do that until it's equal on both sides, right? So once it reaches equilibrium, molecules will stop moving. So diffusion is basically this passive process by which molecules will move from a high concentration to a low concentration until it's reached equilibrium or equal on both sides. This is provided they are allowed to because there's a channel protein that allows for that substance to diffuse through, right? So large molecules cannot, I'm reading this right here, cannot fit through the membrane channels. They have to diffuse through the membrane using carrier mechanisms, so selective permeability. As does water and small soluble molecules, they also have to have a channel protein or carrier to move through. What doesn't need a carrier protein um, or channel protein, what is selectively, it's just um, permeable, right? So they're just straight out permeable are lipids, so fats. Because this lipid bilayer here is okay with lipids, these lipids can go straight through the lipid bilayer. So lipid soluble molecules can go straight through. And then gases, so oxygen and carbon dioxide also go straight through. They don't need a carrier or protein channel. So diffusion movement of molecules from an area of a high concentration to an area of a low concentration, and it's going to depend on these factors. Please read through these. These are really great. The pictures are great to look at because you can see that there are fewer molecules out here, and there's a lot in here, and so they're going to move. But read the examples and read the captions going through these different things. The rate at which things can get through a cell membrane also matter when we talk about physiology. So when you start to learn um, more and you, you go next semester into physiology, the rate of diffusion matters. If things diffuse too slowly, like someone's frozen and they're hypothermic, then that's a problem. Things are getting in too slowly. Oxygen's not diffusing fast enough. Glucose is not diffusing fast enough. And so rate does matter um, when you have to learn physiological processes. So go through those. Osmosis is a little different. Um, osmosis is talking about how water moves. And water goes up the concentration gradient of a solute. So water moves up a concentration gradient of a particular solute, okay? And so that is saying, when you're looking at this, these are water molecules. For this sake, I'm gonna say this is sodium. So the greener sodium and the blue are water. If there's only 
five sodium in here. And there is clearly more than five out here, right? So I'll just do this. So there's greater than five sodium out here. Water is going to move because if there's more than five sodium out here, it's going to have a higher concentration of sodium, right? This is a lower concentration of sodium. And so that means that these sodium are closer together or more concentrated. And so water is going to move out here to make it less concentrated, right? Less concentrated for sodium. So osmosis is really water follows the solutes, right? Water moves up a concentration gradient. So again, I get back to this. Osmosis is water moving to decrease the concentration gradient of a solute. So water's gonna follow the solutes. Uh, an easy way, and so again, you need to read these, but an easy way to describe this to you in terms that you would know is you eat a ton, that's my very scientific term, ton of salt, right? You it just, I love salt. Salt tastes great to me. So I, you know, I put, you put soy sauce on everything or all kinds of salt on everything. Well, you eat that salt and the salt gets absorbed into your blood. And guess what follows out of your digestive tract? So if this is your digestive tract, uh, salt's going to go into your bloodstream and water's going to follow it, right? And so water goes into your bloodstream. And we call that, I feel bloated because water follows solutes. And so if you have, or, or high blood pressure, they tell you not to eat salt because if you eat less salt, you absorb less water and your blood volume is less and that puts less pressure on your circulatory system. So it does lower the pressure in your circulatory system. And so your that pressure is called blood pressure. So, um, Water follows solutes. So osmosis is water moving up a concentration gradient for a particular solute. Um, and that is also a passive process. Again, though, water has to have aquaphorns and there has to be certain things, but um, uh, that osmosis is referring to strictly water. Now, um, facilitated diffusion is what most things that aren't gases or lipid-based, um, they have to be facilitated by the use of a carrier protein or an ion channel. Something needs to be embedded in the cell membrane to facilitate that substance diffusing through the cell membrane. So again, read these carefully, understand this, right? And read the examples because um, it's really well written. Uh, active transport, this uses energy, right? So um, requires energy to be expended. That means your cell has to make energy, right? To have energy. Uh, I, I know everyone knows that food equates to energy, right? So we always think like, oh, food equals energy. But your cells don't use the food you eat. Uh, your cells have to take the food that you eat and take energy um, out of the bonds of the food that you eat and then transfer that energy to uh, ATP, right? So that transfer is you actually have an adenosine diphosphate and you add this high energy bond and attach a third inorganic phosphate to make it triphosphate, right? So your cells have to constantly be creating this ATP to then use um, to make something happen. And one of those things that needs to make happen is active transport. So if you're moving stuff up a concentration gradient, it's like trying to push something up a hill. So if this is a hill, anytime you have to go up a hill, you need to use energy. Going down a concentration gradient or downhill, <clears throat> if you're on a bicycle, you don't need to pedal. It's no energy required. You just roll downhill. But if you have to go 
against a concentration gradient, it's going to require energy. You have to go uphill. And so a lot of the cell's energy requirements, your basal metabolic rate, is creating this ATP to be able to move things against a concentration gradient. An example of this is like a sodium potassium pump that has to maintain a concentration of sodium that's higher on one side of a cell membrane than on the other, and the same for potassium. And so to maintain this um, concentration gradient, your cells have to use a lot of energy because it is an active transport. It's a pump, it's pumping things. So active transport requires energy. It moves substances regardless of a concentration gradient, but a lot of times up a concentration gradient. And um, sometimes it, it moves things in and out of a cell by forming vesicles. So endo and exocytosis form vesicles. Uh, and that vesicle is formed by a part of a cell membrane surrounding something and bringing it into the cell. So the cell membrane will actually break off and become the cell membrane surrounding something inside the cell. And then the cell membrane just kind of closes up after the vesicle um, is brought into the cell. That's endocytosis. If it's exocytosis, the cell membrane here will then kind of open up and merge with the plasma membrane and exocytose or um, release or exit the contents out of the cell. And so this requires energy because you're creating vesicles or um, merging vesicles. Two specific forms of endocytosis are phagocytosis and pinocytosis. So phagocytosis is bacteria eating. It's kind of what it means, but any bacteria or pathogens presented on the cell membrane, um, you have receptors that respond to foreign pathogens, bacteria, viruses, so forth. It will then form a vesicle around that bacterium. It's a white blood cell or a phagosome, and it will bring it in and then have enzymes and lysosomes enter that vesicle and disable this virus or pathogen, and then it will exit the material outside the cell to be cleansed out with your blood and your kidneys. So that's phagocytosis. Pinocytosis is when you take that extracellular fluid next to the cell membrane, and it basically forms a vesicle around that extracellular fluid, and then it can bring it into the cell that way. So that's, it's actually pinocytosis means cell drinking. So, uh, let's see. Okay, so active transport solutes are actively transported by carrier protein regardless of the concentration gradient, and it's giving you examples here, right? Um, ATP matters. If you don't have ATP, guess what? There's no active transport. Um, how many of these pumps or proteins do you have is going to affect the rate, right? So if you only have two sodium potassium pumps, you can only pump via those two sodium potassium pumps. So um, amount of ATP matters and the number of carrier protein channels matter. If you have 10 ATP pumps, then you can do it, you know, five times faster. So the number of carrier, carrier proteins matters with active transport. So go through these right factors, rate, and then it gives you examples. Um, endocytosis, again, pinocytosis, um, it's bringing in that extracellular fluid. In your book, we'll call it cell drinking, I think is the slang they use. Uh, phagocytosis is vesicles specific to um, foreign particles. Right, being brought into the cell. Endocytosis is the general term uh, if it's anything but cell drinking or um, kind of virus eating, right? They all are bringing things into the cell. So again, please read endocytosis and the definition is right here. And then pinocytosis, phagocytosis. Um, there's receptor mediated endocytosis. So this is when a uh, 
hormone or a neurotransmitter will bind to a receptor and that triggers a vesicle to be formed um, surrounding whatever it is. So um, please read through these, super important. Exocytosis is the opposite where the vesicle merges with the cell membrane and thus um, will uh, excrete the contents of whatever is in that membrane. So remember when I talked about insulin? Insulin's created by pancreas. The beta cells of the pancreatic islets. Um, when the, these beta cells have receptors that are monitoring blood glucose levels. If your blood glucose uh, concentration goes up, the pancreatic islets, so this is number one. Number two, the pancreatic islets can then respond by releasing insulin, the hormone insulin. Um, and it does this through exocytosis. So inside this beta cell, <clears throat> there'll be little vesicles of insulin. And <clears throat> when the receptors uh, ha respond to the high blood sugar levels, this will cause the exocytosis of insulin. And so that's how it gets released and absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, neurotransmitters get exocytosed. There's a lot of things that get exocytosed out of a cell. So again, read through this information, super important. Uh, so this just goes through other examples for you to read through and specifically talking about receptor mediated and how that works. Um, by the way, ligand is a general term for, uh, it just means protein. It's general. It's like generic, I should say, generic term. Not, not being specific to any one thing. Uh, now, because there is endocytosis, because there is exocytosis, because channel proteins are being inserted into the membrane or taken out of the membrane, the cell membrane is said to be a fluid uh, structure. Right, so cell membranes have a flow to it. Since things are being introduced into the cell membrane or brought out of the cell membrane, it is um, said to be fluid or in motion. The cell membrane is not a structure that is built and then stays like that forever. Things are happening and changing in that cell membrane. And again, that contributes to the fact that it's selectively permeable. So, one last thing to talk about is uh, when we get into tissues, um, tissues uh, are, are, are going to be different. We're going to talk about epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue is a lining tissue. And so one side of the cell faces the outside, inside of something, and the other side is attached to underlying connective tissue. And then they're attached to one another here on the sides. Uh, and this, this side is, is called the apical surface. And the apical surface a lot of times can have special features depending on the type of cell. So cilia are found in the respiratory tract and microvilli are extensions of the surface area of the cell membrane and is good for <clears throat> absorption. So we're gonna talk about um, specifically when we get to tissues, epithelium, and so forth, those things. Um, so this just gives you an overview. Microvilli, we're going to talk about the microvilli, so kind of review this. We'll talk about that in chapter three. Cilia, we'll also talk about in chapter three. And so preview that. Um, when we talk about epithelium, we're going to talk about cell adhesion molecules. These are these molecules that bind the cells next to one another to create a lining or barrier tissue, right? Um, and so there are cell adhesion molecules. There's three kinds. There's tight junctions, gap junctions, desmosomes, and we will discuss these in chapter three. So just kind of preview and read about those. And that actually concludes this part of um, the lecture for chapter two. All right, you guys still with me?